Today we're going to talk about 1D isentropic flow. The flow in nozzles, diffusers, channels, and things like that are what we, uh, we typically model them as what we call 1D or one-dimensional. Now, if we have a flow like this where we have a, a duct where we have a converging section and a diverging section, the flow will come in and it will drop down and you can see it's changing directions and both of these uh, streamlines here have different directions and you might think, well, that's not one dimensional. But what we mean by one dimensional flow in fluid mechanics is that the fluid properties only vary in the direction of the flow. So for example, if we just put a, like a dotted line here and looked at this point right here, by one dimensional flow, we mean the properties at this point have the, are exactly the same as they are at this point. So even though the flow, and like on the board here, the top flow is going down while the bottom flow is going upright, you know, I guess geometrically uh, that's not one dimensional, but what we mean by one dimensional flow is that we could just follow this flow and if we just draw a line like that through the flow, all the properties are exactly the same. So for example, the density here is the same as the density up here. So that's the definition of one dimensional flow and we're gonna discuss that today. And we go down here, and I'm going to start with an example. And I think you're going to see that we're going to get some surprising results. So, for our example over here, we're going to say we have carbon dioxide is flowing uh, <coughs> steadily through a varying cross-section area duct at the condition shown in the diagram. The gas expands to a pressure of 200 kPa at the exit. The flow is isentropic. And we're asked to determine the density, the velocity, the flow area, and the Mach number at each location along the duct that corresponds to the pressure shown. So we have this converging, diverging duct right here. And then we have CO2. And way upstream here, we have what's called the stagnation region. And so in the stagnation region, the velocity is, is what we call low. It's essentially zero. Uh, the mass flow rate, let's put a little dot over that. The mass flow rate is three kilograms per second. The pressure is 1400 kPa, and the temperature is 200 degrees C. So I've just reproduced that over here. So at the entrance where we're saying, at this entrance we're saying the flow is essentially at stagnation. We have 1400 kPa. And then at different sections along here, we've measured the pressure. So like here's 1000 kPa, 767 kPa, 200 kPa. So let's solve this problem. The way we do this, and I've just reproduced the uh, drawing up here at the top so we can keep track of what we're doing. Uh, we're going to assume that it's an ideal gas. We're going to assume a constant uh, specific heat at room temperature. And we're going to say the inlet is at stagnation conditions. So that's our model. Then we look up the properties. And for CO2, the specific heat is 0.846 kilojoules per kilogram K. Gamma, remember that's our ratio of the specific heat, uh, Cp over Cv. And then our... Uh, R, our uh, specific gas constant, is 188.9 joules per kilogram K. All right, our stagnation temperature is approximately equal to T1, which is 200 degrees C, and I've gone ahead and converted that to uh, absolute 473 Kelvin, because anytime we multiply and divide by a temperature or a pressure, it has to be absolute. The pressure was already given to us at uh, stagnation pressure, which will be P1, was given to us as 1400 kPa, so we don't have to add atmospheric to that. But frequently in our problems, we do have to uh, change from gauge pressure to absolute. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to use the relationships that we have developed thus far, and I'll zoom in on this a little bit. Okay. Uh, we use our isentropic relation for temperature to get our, uh, uh, to get our, well, we have 
the isentropic relation in terms of pressure and temperature. We have our relation that we derive using uh, the Gibbs equation for velocity. We use the equation of state for the density. Uh, we use the definition of mass flow rate for a steady flow to get our area. We use the definition of the Mach number to get the Mach number. And uh, then we have the definition for the speed ascent. So that's how we'll do it. Now, if you look at this duct, what we're used to at um, let me focus that. Okay, what we're normally used to seeing in our everyday lives as if, if the area of the duct decreases, we normally see the velocity increase and we see the pressure go down. And as the area increases, we see the velocity decrease. Okay, that's what we're used to seeing in our everyday lives. But we've done this experiment, we've made these measurements, let's see what results we get. Give me just a second. Okay, so I've taken that um, analysis that we just did, those equations, and I made a little spreadsheet here. And so if we look at the different points on here, I have 1,400, 1,767, so those correspond to the points here. Let's look at the, uh, let's go to this first column. The temperature, uh, well, that's what, these are all the points that are given. So the temperature was 473. The velocity at stagnation is zero. The density is just what we get, 15.67. The speed of sound is 339.4. The area, because we have flow, if we're saying, if, in order for the, uh, if, you, if you're going to say the velocity is zero, the area is going to have to be infinity if you're going to have any kind of flow. So that's not a really a real number there. We know the velocity is not zero, but we approximate it as zero, so the area is going to turn out to be infinity. And then, of course, if there's no flow, the Mach number is zero. So if we go to our next point here where the channel has converged just a little bit, uh, we'll see that the temperature has dropped down to 439. The velocity, just like we expected, has gone up. And then we have our other quantities. The, uh, the Mach number has gone up to about 0.74 and so forth. Now we get to the point uh, right here in the middle where the pressure is 767. And that you can see that that's our point of minimum area there. The temperatures drop more to 413. The velocities increase to 317.8. The Mach number at that point is 1, which is the speed of sound. And then if we go to our exit point, 200, well, what we're used to seeing is as the channel size increases, the uh, velocity will decrease, but look what's happened here. At 200 kPa, the, the temperature went down, but the velocity has continued to increase. So the velocity at the exit now is even higher than it is at that point of minimum area. And that's probably, unless you've had experience in this, that's not something that you would expect. It's the opposite of what you would expect. The density's gone down, the speed of sound has gone down, and the Mach number over here at the exit is now 1.95. It's gone supersonic. So if we look at back here at the channel, coming into the channel, we start with a zero Mach number, and all the way up to the point of minimum area, the Mach number was less than one. So this region over here is subsonic. It reaches the point of minimum area, which by the way we call the throat, and at that point, if all the conditions are right, the Mach number will be one. And then if we go downstream and all the conditions are right, we get what's called supersonic flow. The Mach number is greater than one. So for this particular example, everything downstream here, the Mach number is greater than one. So that probably, if you, if you aren't used to this, that would not be what you would expect. Okay, so we, what we want to look at is uh, the variation of the fluid velocity with flow area. 
Now this duct that we just looked at, and the one I have here, is um, an example of what we call a converging diverging nozzle. And that's how we use to accelerate gases to supersonic speeds. The first use of such a uh, nozzle was made by the Swiss engineer Carl Laval in 1893, and such nozzles are also frequently referred to as Laval nozzles. Okay, so if you hear somebody talking about a Laval nozzle, all they're really talking about is a converging diverging nozzle. Now, does this shape guarantee a supersonic flow? And you probably already know, no it does not because uh, we have these flows with subsonic flows all the time. But let's go and see what we have to do. All right, let's zoom out here a little bit. Hold on. There we go. All right, so we're going to analyze this uh, channel. And from the continuity equation, for a steady flow, we have that the mass flow rate is equal to rho, that's the symbol rho right there for density, times velocity times cross-sectional area. And we know for a steady flow, that's constant. So I'm going to take the uh, continuity equation. Need to zoom out a little bit. There we go. We'll take the continuity equation. I'm going to differentiate all the terms and divide by rho VA. And if I do that, I get d rho over rho plus dA over A plus dV over V equals zero. We're going to call that equation one because we're going to come back and refer to that again a little bit later. Now from the conservation of energy, and we're going to neglect the uh, potential energy terms, we assume steady flow, and there's no work, and there's no heat transfer. So in that case, the, um, and remember these are energies per unit mass, so we have the enthalpy per unit mass plus V squared over 2 equals a constant. I'm going to differentiate that, so we have dH plus dV, I'm sorry, dH plus V dV equals zero. We'll call that equation 2. And then from the second law of thermodynamics, you learn back in your thermal class, TDS equals dH minus dP over rho. We're going to assume that the flow is isentropic. So in the equation that I just had up there, the dS equals zero. So I'll rearrange that and we'll get the dH equals dP over rho. We'll call that equation three. Then I'm going to substitute equation 3 into 2, and we get dP over rho plus V dV equals 0. We'll rearrange that, and we get dV over V equals minus dP over rho V squared. Call that equation 4. We'll, um, we're going to substitute equation 4 back into equation 1 that we did earlier, rearrange it, and we get this expression here. dA over A equals all of this, you can see this. And then I'm going to rearrange that so that we get dA over A equals dP over rho times 1 over V squared minus d rho over dP. Well, last time, uh, I think it was in lecture two, we derived the speed of sun, and we find that for an isentropic process that the partial of rho with respect to P was equal to 1 over the speed of sine squared. Well, we're assuming that we have an isentropic process here, so I'm going to use that relationship. I'm going to plug this into this. And we get this expression here, dA over A equals dP over rho V squared times 1 minus V squared over A squared. Well, V squared over A squared is the Mach number squared. So we plug that in, we have dA over A equals dP over rho V squared times 1 minus the Mach number squared. And we'll call that equation 5. And this is where we were trying to go, so I put a box around it. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the meaning of this equation, because this is important.
All right. Since, um, hold on just a second. Okay, let's talk about this equation. This is an important relation because it tells us how area varies with the Mach number. Now, note that the density, rho, is going to always be positive. You can't have a negative density. And v squared is always going to be positive. Because even if v is negative, uh, v squared will be a positive number. Let me zoom a little bit so you can see it a little better. Okay. Okay, now if the flow is subsonic, also the area is always positive. Okay, if the flow is subsonic, then this term here, 1 minus m squared, is going to be a positive number. And that's going to mean that dA and dP have the same sign, because everything else here is positive. So that means that dA, if dA is positive, meaning the area is increasing, then dP is positive and the pressure is increasing. Okay, so if we have an, uh, a channel where the area is increasing and the flow is subsonic, as the area increases, the pressure increases. If um, we have an air, uh, if the area in our channel, if it's subsonic, if the area is decreasing, the pressure is also decreasing. And you might recall back from Bernoulli's law where you were talking about incompressible flow and uh, inviscid flow, that that's the result you got. The faster the flow, the lower the pressure. And also the smaller the area, the higher the velocity and so forth. So this is consistent with what we know for our incompressible flow, which would be subsonic flow. Okay, now let's go to the next case. If the Mach number is, or if we're supersonic and the Mach number is greater than one, then this term right here is going to be a negative number. All right, well that means if dA is positive, meaning the area is increasing, then that means that uh, dP must be negative because we would have to have a negative times a negative in order to, for that to be positive. So as the area increases, the pr pressure decreases. And that's the opposite of what we are familiar with from our incompressible flow. Well, we're in the supersonic region now, and it's, we don't normally deal with supersonic flow in our everyday lives, so it seems surprising. But if we did, you know, supersonic flow or something we encountered all the time, it would make a lot of sense, but it is the opposite of what we might expect. All right, if the area decreases for supersonic flow, then the pressure must increase. And again, that's the opposite of what we expect. Uh, decreasing area, increasing pressure. Okay, now if the Mach number is 1, then we have a little problem here. And so if the Mach number is 1, then we'll have to talk about that. We'll do that in just a second. All right, let's move on to the next slide here. So we're going to take this equation. Now since dP over rho is equal to minus V dV, we can write equation 5 that we just had up there. Let me zoom out just a little bit. Okay. We can re write equation 5 as dA over A equals minus V dV over V squared times 1 minus M squared. We can rearrange, we can simplify that and rearrange it so that we get dA over dV is equal to the Mach number squared minus 1 times A over V. So I've rewritten that equation on the next page here so that we can talk about it. Let's see, I'll move it right. Okay. So what we have here is dA over dV equals Mach number squared minus 1 A over V. So let's look at the different cases here. For a Mach number less than 1, 
if the Mach number is less than 1, so this term right here is going to be negative, then because A and we say V, uh, what th this is saying is that as area decreases, the velocity will increase. And that's what we're used to for subsonic flow or incompressible flow. As the area decreases, the velocity increases. But this equation also says that for a Mach number greater than 1, which would be supersonic flow, we have dA over dV is less than 1. So if dA dV is, or I'm sorry, less than 0, then the area has to increase as the velocity increases. Okay, and then for a Mach number of less, uh, wait a minute, that's supposed to be a Mach number equals 1. Let's change that to equals 1. Then that's 0, so dA dV has to equal 0. So let's see what that means. This last equation, let me put that up here where you can see it. This last equation tells us that in order to get from subsonic to a supersonic flow, we have to go through a region where dA dV is equal to zero, which means that we have to have a point of minimum area. And that's what we saw in our example. And this point of minimum area is called the throat. So in order to uh, get a supersonic flow, we have to have a converging, diverging duct. Now this is for flow in a duct. The flow has to be converging, diverging. The highest speed that we can get with a converging duct is sonic. If it, all it does is decrease in area and never increases, the highest Mach number we can get is right at the exit, and that's where it would be a Mach number of one. We can never go supersonic flow. And this makes for an interesting situation when considering the inlet of a supersonic aircraft. Because in a jet engine, uh, you want to decelerate the flow as much as possible prior to the flow enter entering the compressor. So you have, uh, let's draw it up on the board here. So let's say this is our engine right here. Um, in order to increase the pressure for a subsonic flow in a duct, we have to increase the area. So if you look at the inlet on a, on a jet aircraft, for example, if you go out to the airport and you're flying on a, uh, an airliner, they're going to be flying at subsonic speeds. And if you look at the inlet, it'll have kind of a shape like this. So the flow comes in and it expands, and that increases the pressure. But if you, have, if you fly at supersonic speeds, and you want to increase the pressure, so this would be the subsonic case here, the, sonic, uh, the, sup the supersonic case would be here, we have to uh, decrease the area like this. So the flow comes in like this. So for a supersonic flow, the inlet is going to have a converging duct. Now if you have a supersonic aircraft, you know that the airport, they take off at a zero velocity. They have to start at subsonic speeds. So how do you think that they make this transition? How do you go from subsonic to supersonic? Well, the way that, uh, about the only aircraft that fly at supersonic speeds are uh, military aircraft, like fighter aircraft, and what they do is they will have a variable geometry on the inlet uh, section right here, so that at subsonic speeds, uh, the geometry will be such that the channel, the area increases, and at supersonic speeds, the channel will decrease. So there'll be a moving plate or something in there that will um, adjust the geometry on supersonic aircraft, so that at supersonic speeds, they'll have a 
converging nozzle, it's subsonic, they'll have a uh, diverging nozzle. So that completes the, uh, the, the current lecture for today, Compressible Flow 3. Thank you.